Please be seated. Executive Vice President Hungerford, faculty colleagues, alumni, doctoral candidates, and their families and friends. Good afternoon and welcome to convocation for PhD candidates in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. I thank all of you for coming to celebrate the many accomplishments of our PhD candidates. We honor today a magnificent group who at commencement this coming Wednesday will join the ranks of our 40,000 GSAS alumni. These scholars in 63 doctoral disciplines will embark on academic and professional careers around the world in the great tradition of Columbia University. Equally important, we also honor today the families and friends of our candidates who have endured with them the grueling marathon, the grueling marathon of the PhD. <laughs> A special recognition is due today to the mothers in the audience who I'm sure have wondered more than once whether this day would finally arrive. <laughs> what a Mother's Day present. Thank you for being so supportive and above all, for being so very patient. I would ask all doctoral candidates to rise and applaud those family members and friends who have helped them to be here today. Today's address to the PhD graduating class will be offered by Professor Turkuler Ishexel. Turkuler Ishexel is Associate Professor of Political Science at Columbia University, where she is currently also serving as Deputy Chair of the department. She earned her undergraduate degree in politics from the University of Edinburgh and her PhD in political science from Yale. In her research, Professor Ishak Sel explores the ways in which international institutions can support, strengthen, or undermine domestic constitutional democracy. In her book, Europe's Functional Constitution, a Theory of Constitutionalism Beyond the State, she attributes the EU's democratic woes to its origins as a market-building project. She is currently writing a book entitled Are Corporate Rights Wrong? that focuses on the fundamental rights claims that corporations make in, the democratic, in democratic societies. Her research has appeared in leading journals, including the Journal of Politics, the European Journal of International Law, Human Rights Quarterly, International Journal of Constitutional Law, and the European Law Journal. Prior to coming to Columbia, Professor Isaac Schell was an Emil Noel Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence. She has also held visiting positions at Harvard, Princeton, and Goethe Universitat. She will be the Neil McCormick Fellow in Legal Theory at NYU School of Law during the coming academic year. Professor Isaac Shell grew up in Istanbul and is a former president of the European Youth Parliament. Today being Mother's Day, her two children, Elia, who's almost seven, and Aidan, who's three and a half, are here in the audience. And I'm told 
that they have promised to let mommy finish her presentation all the way to the end. <laughs> Professor Isik Shell. Executive Vice President Hungerford, Dean Alonso, distinguished faculty colleagues, doctoral candidates, esteemed families, and friends. It is an incredible honor to be asked to address you on this momentous day. I have to spend the rest of my career trying to earn it. I spent most of my time in graduate school agonizing over what I could say about the European Union's legal development that hadn't yet been said. I met Fred in the fluorescent gloom of the law library's basement, where I was mindlessly reading European court decisions from the 1960s, hoping for a discovery or a bolt of inspiration. The thick, cloth-bound court records were arranged on mobile shelving units, the ones that make entire lifetimes of reading glide back and forth like a graceful accordion. Fred was always there whenever I returned to look up a new case. Sometimes I would be away for several months, distracted by life or by writer's block, but when I returned, it would be like no time had passed. His steadfast presence encouraged me to keep plugging away despite all my self-doubt. He was still there when I made a final frantic visit to, see the library, to the library to look up some final references, though I'm sorry to say that in my haste, I forgot to say goodbye. As you've probably guessed by now, Fred was not a person in the conventional sense. He was, to be specific, a cockroach. <laughs> he had expired on the linoleum at some indeterminate date. Perhaps he predated the European Union. Perhaps he would outlast it. The fact that a dead roach was one of my sources of solitude, um, so, sorry, my sources of fortitude, speaks <laughs> <laughs> volumes about the, the loneliness of the graduate school experience. It's also deeply unfair to my advisors, mentors, classmates, family members, and friends who supported me throughout, including my life partner who I met at an orientation party. A political theorist and a mathematician, we certainly wouldn't have met in the wild. Some of the challenges of a PhD are universal. The challenge of knowing where to start. Or as I discovered during my seventh year, the challenge of knowing when to finish. But your cohort rose above some unique challenges. Many of you lost loved ones to a brutal pandemic. You missed out on spending precious months in the company of family and friends. You were supposed to be doing path-breaking research, but couldn't visit a physical library or a lab. You couldn't travel to conferences or conduct field work. At least I never had to hop on a Zoom call with Fred. Your cohort has had the Coney Island cyclone of all graduate school journeys. You worked hard, not only through a pandemic, but through a resurgence of racism, xenophobia, and racially motivated violence, an insurrection against democracy here at home, and attacks on political freedom worldwide. So take a moment to acknowledge what, and more importantly, who, made your load lighter when things were tough. Before you move on, think about what others did and said to encourage you during your time in graduate school. What motivated you to try again when you hit a roadblock? What eased the solitude of your toil? Those are the things to remember so you can pay them forward. We all remember that journal reviewer. Don't be that reviewer. <laughs> For my part, I remain incredibly grateful that graduate school gave me an opportunity to see where my curiosity led. I felt spoiled by the unfathomable richness of my intellectual community. I couldn't believe my luck. A university was paying me to think thoughts and learn things. I regard our profession as one of immense privilege in this respect. We get to take deep dives into questions that may be interesting to only a handful of other people. 
We get to do work that we care about and identify with, to teach the topics that matter to us and to our students. Notice that I'm not mentioning all the grading we still have to do, uh, but I'm trying to keep it upbeat. Doing work that isn't alienating, demeaning, or exploitative should be a universal right. Alas, it is a privilege reserved for a shockingly small few in our society. At the same time, our profession involves immense vulnerability, particularly in the years following graduation. To pursue the sublime life of the mind, we first have to conquer the long odds of the academic job market, to find a position that pays a living wage and values our chosen line of inquiry. We are often forced to slot our passions into the priorities of institutions that need courses taught and to compete for a shrinking pool of resources. In my own research, I study the ways in which the imperatives of the market shape and in many cases distort valuable norms and practices such as citizenship, constitutionalism, and human rights. Regrettably, in a corporate civilization, institutions that pursue a mission other than profit are under pressure to behave more like firms. Harvard, so the quip goes, is a hedge fund with a school attached to it. That's not true of Columbia, of course. <laughs> We're in real estate. But in a way, to pursue a PhD is to refuse to participate in the knowledge economy. Nothing says I'm not in it for the money like a six, seven, eight year degree that may or may not result in a full time job. That's what I call a rebel. For those of us who come from non academic families, the choice can be hard to explain. We take as long as medical doctors to train and even call ourselves doctors but we can't answer a flight attendant's call when a passenger needs medical attention mid-air. And when you land that coveted assistant professor position, you may still have a proud auntie who introduces you as my niece. She's not a student anymore. She's the professor's assistant at Columbia. <laughs> my students have heard me say that going on the academic job market is a bit like competitive fishing. You may offer the dazzling lure of a path-breaking dissertation, but at the end of the day, it's up to the fish whether to bite. I hope this metaphor brings a bit of solace to anyone currently experiencing the anxiety of the academic job search. But it may be even more useful later on in your career, one day when you find yourself on a squabbling hiring committee, the cognitive agility of a carp may seem like a high bar. To be a junior scholar is to careen between these contradictory experiences of privilege and vulnerability. To these, we might add a third, an anxiety about relevance, or what I think of as the ivory tower complex. The world often tells us that we academics are not just disinterested, but uninterested in our messy world and uninteresting to it. And most of us occasionally fear that they might be right. I can suggest one way to keep this worry at bay. You see, another of the great privileges of our profession is teaching and mentoring students. If my insecurities about the value of my scholarship are well-founded, then I can still earn my keep by working hard to motivate my students. Bright, determined, opinionated, creative people to apply their own sense of wonder in ways that will change the world for the better. You, the PhD class of 2023, already know that for a scholar, the key to relevance is not parroting the latest buzzwords, but using whatever privileges your career gives you to help reduce the vulnerability of others. You are exceptionally well equipped to do this because during your time here, many of you threw yourself into struggles for equity, inclusion, and social justice. You mobilized and organized for fair wages and decent work conditions. You engaged in activism to address impending climate change. 
uh, impending climate catastrophe. I think the change is no longer impending. You exemplified solidarity, determination, and civic mindedness. For so many of you, it wasn't enough to simply pursue scholarly excellence. You lived up to the tradition of generations of Columbia students who've treated the university as a microcosm for the kind of change you want to see in the world. I imagine that many of you did not always experience the university as hospitable to your demands. Whether this came as a disappointment or as a confirmation of your priors, by now you know. Universities can't escape the patterns of inequality and domination that scar the whole of our society. But we shouldn't underestimate what university communities can do to help heal those scars. Thanks to your commitment to your values in the face of adversity, you are not only experts in topics like the genetic and environmental determinants of recombination in coronaviruses, the application of AI in non-stationary markets, the impact of structural racism on stillbirth rates, the strontium molecular lattice clock, body snatching in contemporary Anglophone drama, <laughs> a new class of analysis-based fast transforms, the transformation of Chinese fiction in the era of photolithography, polymer grafted nanoparticle membranes. So I could keep going, but as you can tell, I've read uh, through all 556 thesis titles, um, but please don't ask me what a nanoparticle membrane is. Reading your dissertation titles was an awe-inspiring and humbling experience, like standing under a starry night sky and trying to wrap my mind around the unfathomable energy and brilliance of each star. And I know that some natural scientists are silently judging me for that sappy metaphor. <laughs> Maybe the complex scholars too, tough crowd. But not only does your collective expertise span nearly the full spectrum of humanistic and scientific knowledge, you are now equally well equipped to fight pernicious trends affecting the academy. Trends such as the casualization of academic work, the uncertain promise of education as a path to social mobility, and the gutting of policies designed to remedy centuries of race and gender-based exclusion. Your cohort has already set an admirable example in insisting that we can only further our mission of education, critical inquiry, and public service if we are a fair, inclusive, and equitable community. And that is what makes universities essential no matter which way the political winds are blowing. It's also why universities and scholars make such high priority targets for autocrats far and near. Because we answer to a different authority. The autonomy of the university, its rival status as a producer of knowledge, a checker of facts, and above all, a manufactory of questions, offends autocrats because their power hinges on their ability to monopolize what counts as knowledge and to control the questions that can be asked. So you see, you're not just cosplaying in gowns. You are the anchors that will keep our society from drifting into the abyss of post-truth and disinformation. No pressure. What makes scholars fearsome to autocrats is also why we can stop panicking about chatbots. Scholars are not knowledge aggregators or walking libraries, and most of us don't aspire to be that. Our specialty is asking good questions. Obviously, you don't need a PhD to ask good questions. Last week, my three-year-old asked me, what's on top of space, mommy? <laughs> if there's an astrophysicist in the audience, please identify yourself to a member of the flight crew. I was raised in an educational tradition where I had to memorize and regurgitate what someone else called knowledge. When I started graduate school, I was good at that. But I couldn't do what my kids can, ask questions that stump people with fancy titles and degrees. Looking back, I realized that the reason I spent so long agonizing in the company of a dead cockroach or watching daytime television was because I hadn't mastered the fine art of asking the right questions nor did I know what counted as a good question. I was like an unthinking chatbot, 
waiting for someone to throw it a prompt. But it's not just that questions precede knowledge. We all know that for something to qualify as knowledge, the research must be designed in just the right way and its integrity rigorously scrutinized by our peers. But yeah, don't be that reviewer. And even once we get into that top journal, our answers are fallible and provisional, whereas questions abide. Good questions unlock life's mysteries. They diminish our ignorance. They relate us to others. They foul autocrats. I can't wait to watch all of you achieve these monumental tasks. I have no doubt that you will, knowing what you have already achieved. A big cheer for all of you and everyone who supported you. Congratulations, Columbia PhD class of 2023. Thank you, Professor Ishikstel. We now arrive at the central point of the ceremony, the presentation of the doctoral candidates. We ask you to come forth as we call your name in recognition of your individual accomplishments as you cross the stage. Receiving the doctoral degree in chemistry. Arden Samantha Lee. Davida Marie Rios. Pierre Alexander Devlemink. Paul Joseph Pagano Robinson. John Landstrom Weber. Allison Lee. Marina Alamo Bryan. Saronda Jane. Eduardo Javier Romero Dianderas. Jeffrey Lee Benjamin. Bertrand Adonje. Amir Hossein Jafarian. Suk Ho Hong. Philip Dinenes. Receiving the doctoral degree in applied physics. Song Shang Tao. Receiving the doctoral degree in art history and archaeology. Monica Kathleen Bulger. <laughs> Susanna Evelyn Blair. Receiving the doctoral degree in applied physics. Yoheved Unger. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in art history and archaeology. Rathanamol Singh Johal. <laughs> Roja Marain Lansman. Angel Jiang. 
Alexander Exergian. Erhan Tamur. Receiving the doctoral degree in astronomy. Rose Catherine Gibson. Aaron Chan. Receiving the doctoral degree in biomedical engineering. Paul Kemper. Receiving the doctoral degree in biological sciences. Dita Alagabandin Moenian. Receiving the doctoral degree in biomedical engineering. Tamara Gedankin. Idan Kotalie. Andrew Basilio. Andy J. Han Lee. Daniel Navid Tavakol. Su Yu He. Hong Yu. Receiving the doctoral degree in biological sciences. Blanche Lucille Fields. <laughs> Yo Ting Ya. Sha Ting Li. Chan Lu. Zheng Shan Hu. Li Ji Liu. Michael Taylor Kimball. Receiving the doctoral degree in biomedical informatics. Anna Ostropoletz. Amanda Josephine Moy. Jonah Eric Einzen. Receiving the doctoral degree in management. Su Min Cho. Yu Jin Jenna Song. Woo! Catherine Sun. Erica Bailey. Woo! James T. Carter. Receiving the doctoral degree in business. Patrick Perkowski. <laughs> Fabrizio Dell'Acqua. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in accounting. Ching Kai Dong. Iran Kang. <laughs> Wen Chang Pan. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in decision, risk, and operations. Yuan Ling Gang. <laughs> Anand Hulvi. Yun Bei Shu. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in finance. Rit Kirati. <laughs> Vrinda Mittal. <laughs> Sharada Shreeder. Young Chiao Li. <laughs> 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 
receiving the doctoral degree in marketing. Cybelle Sozuer Zorlu. Receiving the doctoral degree in Cellular, Molecular, and Biomedical Studies. John Francis Tudnam. Karen Gomez. Florencia Gabriela Velez Cortez. Yaselin Racinos. Sebastian Andres Quintremil. Joshua Debak Cho. Xenia Rubkina. Receiving the doctoral degree in civil engineering and engineering mechanics. Beatrice Giacomini. Maria Katsidonia Taki. <laughs> Wei E. Lee. Receiving the doctoral degree in chemical engineering. Robert J. Tannenbaum. <laughs> Bebolina Dara. Alejandro Krauskopf. Solomon Bainstein. <laughs> Karthik Mailvahanan. <laughs> Akash Biswas. <laughs> Richard May. <laughs> Emma Willett. <laughs> Nadim Massad. Ten Jiang Wang. Ganem Obeid Hablil. Shu Shi Pong. Rui Su. Nikhil Rampal. Receiving the doctoral degree in civil engineering and engineering mechanics. Yang Yu. <laughs> Le Chen Li. Receiving the doctoral degree in classics. Lin Van Heel. Receiving the doctoral degree in classical studies. Maria Dimitropoulos. <laughs> Tal A. Ishalom. <laughs> Deborah Sokolowski. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in communications. Danielle Lee Thompson. <laughs> Alexandre Albert Gonsalves. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in computer science. Woo! Rose Sloan. <laughs> Tariq Al Hindi. Savis Petridis. <laughs> Katie Giro. <laughs> Keon Vafa. <laughs> Kushin Pei. <laughs> Shoikov Chakraborty. <laughs> Ryan Bernstein. <laughs> Emmanuel Vlatakis Karagunis. Lampros Flokas. Yi Chen Chen. David Watkins. Receiving the doctoral degree in Earth and Environmental Engineering. 
Dong Ping Song. Sarah Hamilton. Anas Farkad Alkani. Receiving the doctoral degree in Earth and Environmental Sciences. Nicholas Alexander O'Mara. Rebecca Jean Herman. Receiving the doctorate in East Asian Languages and Cultures, Wudong Ming. Cheng Wei Yang. Sao Yi Fong. Tracy Sky Stylerman. Michelle Leilani Hauk. Pooja Mukesh Choksi. Johanna Jensen. Receiving the doctoral degree in Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. Pallavi Amritha Kache. Vijay Ramesh. Sarika Ann Conwilker. Patrick McKenzie. Receiving the doctoral degree in economics. Harris Mateen. Naman Garg. Shistoff Zaremba. Howard Zihao Zhang. Sunil Paramu. Roman Gabriel Rivera. Vargav Gopal. Wu Liu. Tam T. Tan Mai. Hong Ken Tio. Ye Ji Sang. Anastasia Buria. Marcella Davitaya. Amanda Aku Ahonam Awadi. Eugene Larson Halleck. Yu Kyung Ko. Bruno de Albuquerque Furtado. Kyle Gibson Coombs. Yu Fu Wang. Andrew Robert Olenski. Shimon Conrad Sacher. Rui Duart Mushkarenash. Bu Kang Sol. Receiving the doctoral degree in electrical engineering. Ashish Jayant Shukla. Sam Buchanan. Matthew Bajer. Arnesh Mithal. Song Han. Prachi Patel. Claudia Chea. Prawesh Dahal. Eric Pullman. Mateos Corato Zanarela. Anik James. Asher Novik. Anthony Rizzo. Stuart Richard Dodlin. Receiving the doctoral degree in English and Comparative Literature. Diana Rose Newby. Milan Tobias Terlunen. Martin Larson Zhu. Oh. 
Katherine Ritter Bohannon. Jonathan P. Reeve. Lisa Del Sol. Bo McMillan. Aiden Simon Levy. Karina Del Valle Shorsky. Bo McMillan. Receiving the doctoral degree in environmental health sciences. Miss Beth Dauda. Receiving the doctoral degree in epidemiology, Michelle L. Nolan. Receiving the doctoral degree in French and Romance philology, Noni Denise Carter. Molly Lorraine Lindbergh. Catherine Raiklin. Receiving the doctoral degree in genetics and development, Yi Jing Chen, Wang Chi Wang. Receiving the doctoral degree in history, Matthew Eric Pissar Joseph, Noah Aaron Rosenblum, Nada Khalifa, Andrew Lebovich. Nader Hamad Atasi. Robin Sarah Reich. Wen Ray Zhao. Thomas B. Zuber. Receiving the doctoral degree in Italian, Catherine Shepard Bloomer. Alejandro Quadrado. Lorenzo Macosi. Luca Napolniello. Claudia Maria Sbutoni. Andrew LaSalle Wyatt. Receiving the doctoral degree in mathematics, Yash Uday Deshmukh, Juan Alvaro Munoz Echanis, Song Yu, Robin Zhang, Wei Tao Zhu. Receiving the doctoral degree in Latin American and Iberian studies. Analia Levine. Kathleen <laughs> Evanson. Receiving the doctoral degree in mechanical engineering. Smithy Patacharya. Abinandan Antony. Chao Wang. Courtney Adair Peterson. <laughs> Xu Yang Fang. Mark Christopher Barbeth. Carly Lagrada. Receiving the doctoral degree in mechanical engineering, Emily Hannigan. <laughs> Nicole Alicia Lim Lee. Tatiana Luna. Danielle Strammel. Rand Reis Tajadin Hedaya. Johnny Michi. John Whitehead. Jonathan David Bludinger. 
receiving the doctoral degree in microbiology, immunology, and infection. Peter Hanzu Wang. Adam Elliot Kornberg. Receiving the doctoral degree in Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African studies. John Clifford Hallowell. Asil Najib. Receiving the doctoral degree in music. Sean Gaspar Colonna. Madeline Lucille Turner. Sonia Gleason Wormager. Receiving the doctoral degree in music composition. Finola Kazabon Merivale. Saad Nadim Haddad. Receiving the doctoral degree in music. Nandini Rupa Banerjee Datta. Mary Catherine Stumbos. Receiving the doctoral degree in neurobiology and behavior. Amin Najatbach. Jacob Phineas Portis. Lisa Catherine Randolph. Leslie Joan Seibener. Receiving the doctoral degree in nursing. Yashika Sharma. Molly Xiaojing Hobensack. Sarah Stover Feiler Zolweg. Receiving the doctoral degree in nutritional and metabolic biology, Mariah Noel Green. Receiving the doctoral degree in operations research, Yuan Lu Bai. Receiving the doctoral degree in, in industrial engineering and operations research, Jacob. Bergquist. <laughs> Noemi Perve Pernevi. Receiving the doctoral degree in operations research. Asharaf Bahamu. <laughs> Shu Jia Liu. Receiving the doctoral degree in industrial engineering. Tuche Karatash. Receiving the doctoral degree in operations research. Sha Tian Wang. Mitchell Perry. Receiving the doctoral degree in molecular pharmacology and therapeutics. Andrea Carola Urso. Receiving the doctoral degree in physics. Ashley James Bransgrove. Roman Lawrence Behrens. Noah Bitterman. Stephen Glenn Harrelson. Alan Kahn. Emily Caitlin Tiberi. Barbara Cruvinel Santiago. Sarah Shabani, Apur Jindal, Augusto Giotu, Ran Jing, Tian Yu Zhu, Guan Hao Sun, Claire Lauren Warner, Yong Jie Jua. Receiving the doctoral degree in pharmacology and molecular signaling. Dallin Dressman. 
receiving the doctoral degree in political science. Sean Kanoa Keen Hiroshima. Simone Pachi. Charlene Biondi. Oscar Mauricio Pocasangre Meneses. Jacqueline Kasi Davis. Nora Shiken To. Da Sol Jan. Li Nan Yao. Receiving the doctoral degree in psychology. Chelsea Marie Harmon. Andrea Felice Fields. Dara Melody Huggins. Receiving the doctoral degree in religion. Erez de Golem. Elizabeth F. L. Dolphy. John Nicholas Takas. Receiving the doctoral degree in Slavic languages. Milica Ilicic. <laughs> Elaine Veronica Wilson. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in sociology. Erella Portugali. <laughs> Alexander Joshua Alexanian. Anna Patricia Hidalgo. <laughs> Catherine Nightingale Kana. Francisco Lara Garcia. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in statistics. Alejandra Quintos Lima. <laughs> Owen Gerard Ward. Andrew Davison. <laughs> Chun Liang Tang. <laughs> Gi Tong Chi. <laughs> Long Chao. Jalin Ouyang. <laughs> Receiving the doctoral degree in theater. Ilana Gilovich Wei. Anne Melissa Potter. Anna Louise Waller. Receiving the doctoral degree in urban planning. Gayatri Kalra. Min Kwok Gwen. Receiving the doctoral degree in anthropology and education. Daniel Rudas Burgos. Receiving the doctoral degree in comparative and international education. Romina Quezada Morales. Daniel Shepard. Receiving the doctoral degree in English education. Kevin Christopher Spinelli. Receiving the doctoral degree in counseling psychology. Randy Scott McLaughlin. Receiving the doctoral degree in cognitive science and education. Jean Tang. Receiving the doctoral degree in educational leadership. Rachel Harari. Receiving the doctoral degree in philosophy and education. Timothy F. Ignafo. And now, my closing remarks to the graduating class. 
With the procession of scholars across this stage today, you have witnessed the seemingly inexhaustible variety of fields and departments encompassed by your colleagues in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia. Yet, regardless of the discipline in which you will receive formally your doctoral degree this coming Wednesday, what you have learned during your stay here has not been just a way of asking questions about particular subjects, but the discipline of interrogation itself. Hence, you should be proud of and faithful to what you have learned here, but the discipline of asking questions requires that you not be so proud, proud of, nor so faithful to that knowledge that you will not be able to critique the very education you have acquired in this institution. In order to be continually open to the new, you must make, take your distance from the presumed necessity of what you have learned. To challenge what defines you as belonging to your academic origins, to entertain at every turn the possibility of self-imposed exile from your disciplinary home. It will be at such moments that you will renew the legitimacy of the degree and the trust that this institution has deposited in you by granting it. At such moments, it will be worth remembering that you were conferred this degree so you would ask questions critically, doggedly, and unsparingly, even if the one not spared be yourself. In fact, the kind of openness to the new that I'm invoking and the vigilance required for it to manifest itself continually in your scholarly eye is learned every single day in the negotiation of all the experiences with which life will present you, all the daily instances in which your capacity to confront change or to become the agent of change will be challenged not just by what is new and unforeseen, but even more insidiously, but what is customary and what is expected of you. The vexing gift that your Columbia graduate education has given you will require you to continuously entertain in your mind the most radical thought experiments. What if the world were otherwise than it is? What if you should not be whom you thought you should be? And then to reimagine both the world and yourself anew. It is a gift that keeps on taking, that continually makes ever larger demands of you. Remember that you were methodically trained to be an agent of new understanding and that preserving the authority of received knowledge is decidedly not the reason why Columbia is conferring up, up, upon you a PhD degree. Today, surrounded by the community of your graduate colleagues, faculty mentors, and family members, and despite the toil and sacrifices of your graduate years, you begin what in reality will be your most arduous and solitary assignment yet, keeping your intellectual life aflame on your own and allowing it to consume everything, even your most cherished ideas and beliefs. This is, this is the sweet burning without surcease that your graduate education has sparked, the one that you will be henceforth have to nurture rigorously and lovingly by yourself. You are trained now to search for and find the places where the world shows its seams and points of articulations so that you may press either slightly or forcefully on them until other possibilities of conceiving the world reveal themselves to you. It is not for the faint of heart, but it is an ingrained habit that is now a part of you because of your experiences here. The Argentinian writer Julio Cortázar once described a staircase and the act of climbing it 
in a manner that uncannily recalls the perspective that I'm attempting to convey to you, where even the most mundane acts can reveal unsuspected complexity, complexities if considered with wonderment and a critical eye. Cortázar says, no one will have failed to observe that frequently the floor bends in such a way that one part rises at a right angle to the plane formed by the floor, and the following section arranges itself parallel to the flatness of the floor so as to provide a step to a new perpendicular, a process that may be repeated to highly variable elevations. If you were to place your left hand in one of the vertical parts and the right hand upon the corresponding horizontal, you would be in momentary possession of a step. Each one of these steps formed, as we have seen, by two elements is situated somewhat higher and further than the one prior, a principle that provides meaning to a staircase because any other combination that might perhaps produce more beautiful or picturesque shapes would surely be incapable of taking you from the ground floor to the floor above it. You tackle a stairway face on because if you tried it backwards or sideways, it would be especially uncomfortable. The natural stance consists of holding oneself upright, arms hanging easily at the sides, head erect, but not so much that the eyes no longer see the steps immediately above, and breathing lightly and with regularity. To climb a staircase, one begins by lifting that part of the body located below and to the right usually encased in leather or canvas, and which, with a few exceptions, fits exactly on the step. Having set down set part on the first step, and for convenience we shall call it the foot, one draws up the equivalent part on the left side, also called foot, but not to be conf confused with the foot cited earlier, and lifting this other part to the level of the foot and makes it continue along until it sets in place on the second step, at which point the foot will rest on the second step. And the foot will rest on the first. The first steps are always the most difficult until you acquire the necessary coordination. Also, the coincidence of names between the foot and the foot makes the explanation more difficult. Be especially careful never to raise at the same time both the foot and the foot. <laughs> Having arrived at the, by this procedure to the second step, it's easy enough to repeat the movements al alternately until the top of the stairs staircase is reached. One gets off the staircase easily with a light tap of the heel to fix the structure in place to make sure it will be there waiting when one is ready to come down. <laughs> Eric, Eric from once said that, I quote, one cannot be this deeply responsive to the world without being saddened very often. And yet, the world is still a wondrous place, even with its squalor, sham, and injustice, because there are people in it just like you, who have the intellectual and effective tools to think of another version of it and to remake it anew. I hope you will embrace that obligation and that privilege and recognize that a deep engagement with even the most mundane everyday activities 
climbing a staircase, for example, can reveal new vistas for rethinking the world otherwise. We arrive then at the end of this magnificent ceremony. Go forth to be our representatives and emissaries to the world, and all of us at Colombia will rejoice in your inevitable achievements. Prosper and prevail. Make us and your relatives and friends even more proud of you than we are today. Will the candidates stand so that we, we may give them a final round of applause, please? You are all invited to a champagne reception immediately following the ceremony at Ansel Plaza under the tent. I ask friends and families to wait to exit until after the faculty and the candidates have ascended the low library steps. Friends and family, we ask that you please exit the guest tents as promptly and as safely as possible. You may meet your graduate on the upper campus at Ansel Plaza. So at this time, we ask that you please exit the guest tents as promptly as you can so that we can prepare for our next ceremony. Thank you.